What does success look like for a fashion company in the 21st century? How should it be managed to get there? And what type of products will it supply to the market? This session will take a pragmatic view on what it is like to run a sustainable business, and with all the opportunities that are available now, how do you prioritize them? Please welcome pioneer Stella McCartney, whose commitment to sustainability is evident throughout all of her collections and has been part of the brand's DNA since day one. I have personally been friends with Stella McCartney for 25 years, and I have seen her fearlessly and unwaveringly make her commitment to having made a commitment to making the world a prettier and better place. Please welcome Stella. Stella is joined on stage by the award-winning author, producer, and recipient of the Order of Canada, former editor-in-chief of Vanity Fair, Graydon Carter. That's a long walk. Can you hear me on this? That was a resounding no. <laughs> <laughs> um, I feel very honored uh, to be uh, talking to Stella, a woman I have great admiration for. And I have great admiration for this organization and this conference. And here we are in this beautiful city on this very beautiful day. I'm just going to go through some of the greatest hits up until the point when you actually start working. Just for anybody um, out here who has been following every day for the last 25 years. Stella grew up on an organic farm in England. Um, her mother was a photographer, a very good photographer. Her sister is a photographer as well and a musician. Uh, her father was a musician of some re renown. <laughs> she went to Central St. Martin's, the great design school in London. She apprenticed under Christian Lacroix. And then she followed Karl Lagerfeld uh, to be the head designer at, at uh, Chloe, which is not an easy task. Uh, 17 years ago, she leaves Chloe. She starts her own firm. And it's now a quarter billion dollar business with 50 stores around the world. Tell me when I'm getting it wrong. She designed the uniforms for the uh, British Olympic team at the opening ceremonies and for the Paralympic Games. Um, and she's in the process of buying back her company from Caring that'll take place over the next few years. Um, for the purposes of our talk today, she's not only an icon of the fashion world, but she's an icon of the sustainability movement and Stella McCartney. Wow, can we? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's just leave it at that. Okay. I'm really happy. Yeah. Thanks for having me. And um, we can just close there if you want. Okay, so let's go back to the start. Okay, how much influence did your parents have on you? Uh, well, look, you know, it's funny answering that question because obviously I have very well known parents. Um, I think everyone's parents have a massive influence on them. So, you know, I only know what I know. Um, but in co the context of this conversation, yeah. they had. That's uh, the one we're uh, in, right? Yeah. Yes. As opposed to like a therapy <laughs> session. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it was terrible. Uh -huh. um, no, you know, it was. They had a huge influence on me and on many different levels. And I think, you know, obviously. The big one was being mindful, mm -hmm. growing up on a farm, seeing the seasons, seeing animals give birth, seeing, you know, and just being aware of what was going on around us and not being so self-absorbed as humans that I wasn't aware that we were having an impact on the land and on, on the fellow creatures that we live on the planet with. So a big influence. You've talked about your, your father and the, the, his Savile Row suits and sort of being interested in them and how they were constructed, that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, on a base level, on a sort of fashion level, um, they were a huge influence also. I mean, one thing for me... Which Savile Row tailor did he go to? He used to go to Tommy Nutter. I, I knew you were going to say that. Yeah, okay, yeah. Um, who was a British Savile Row tailor, and Very he did all the rock 60s. stars. Yeah, he yeah. was amazing. I didn't meet Tommy, but I, I worked when I went to St. Martin's in my 
hours off, I went and studied with his pattern cutter and then Savile Row Taylor. Um, so yeah, visually and in a fashion sort of sense, they were also a huge influence to me. I mean, I grew up in a weird, you know, my brand is very, um, it's built of sort of opposing characters. So there's a sort of a masculine and a feminine, there's, and, and that's very much, I think, influenced from my parents. And seeing them on stage, you know, my mum and dad were in a band called Wings, and it was very androgynous, actually. I look at um, their wardrobe, because I'm lucky they kept a lot of their clothes, and I'll be like, oh, this is an amazing shirt, and it'll have a, like a silk shirt with swallows on it. Jumpsuits and that sort of and thing. And jumpsuits. And um, I'll be like, oh, this is an amazing blouse of my mum's. And then, like, two months later, I'll see a picture of my dad on stage wearing the blouse, and I'll be like, oh, okay. I didn't know dad was wearing blouses, but so, it, it, you know, there was a, an amazing kind of one minute we were on a farm in Scotland in kind of fair ass sweaters and cords and, on, and then the next day we were, they were like in glittery, you know, thigh high platforms. So you ship off to Central St. Martin's and you go under the, you don't go under the name Stella McCartney because it's still so fresh, you, you change your name to Stella Martin? No, I, not when I was there. When, when I was oh. at school, I went to, um, I, you know, I was very fortunate. I went to the local state school right. in, in the countryside. And I don't think we were legally allowed to change my name on forms, but I would always go under the name of Stella Martin. When I went to George St. Martin? Martin's, from George Martin, no. Oh. No, not, no, it, it could have oh, been, but okay. it wasn't really. Um, and so I always would sort of enter a room with a different last name, just so that I didn't feel prejudged or pre-assessed or kind of, you know, I, I like to come in with a clean slate. But when I went to Chloe, there wasn't, I couldn't really avoid it. But at Central St. Martin's you had, didn't you have like Naomi Campbell and Kate Moss walk your clothes down the runway, which may have given something away that you yeah. might have been wrong. like I said, I'm famous. full of opposing elements. Or does everybody get that at Central St. Martin's? <laughs> no, I'm okay. one of the lucky few. No, you know what it was? I was living in London and they were my friends. They were my genuine girlfriends. And um, we were just sort of hanging out. Kate was living with me at the time and we were just having fun, you know? And I came to my degree show and they said, so do you want your own models or should we supply models? And I was like, I'll take my own models. So you, so, you, <laughs> so, so, so you go to work at you, the Christian Lacroix, then you, you follow Karl Lagerfeld into Chloe. Was he supportive or not supportive? You know the answer to that question. <laughs> I, um, I, at 15, I went to Paris. I worked with Lacroix, and I, worked, I did a, like a, a little bit of work experience with Saint Laurent. And, um, you know, I, was, I always knew I wanted to be a fashion designer. I went early on and really committed to that, um, that kind of dream. And then, yeah, I, I left school and people wanted to buy my collection. I didn't know what to do. At St. Martin's, they were more kind of encouraging of you making a dress out of spaghetti than having a business. And so I was like, what do you mean? You want to order my clothes? They're vintage, they're Savile Row. I, I don't know how to do this. And so a year into that, I got a call from Chloe and they said, do you want to come to Paris? Um, and I thought, I was like, yeah, this is great. I'll put my brand on hold because I was, being, I was overwhelmed by its, its, you know, its success. And, um, and I thought nobody would notice. I genuinely thought, and I was so naive, I just thought, you know, you go to Paris, like that's the capital of fashion and there's massive brands and the most famous designers in the world and nobody will notice me slipping oh, in. Yes. Um, if you've been so Ringo Carl, Starr's daughter, Carl it might have been easier. <laughs> yeah, on crying. Are you friends with Carl since, or is that... Yeah, I mean, I don't hang okay. out with Carl okay. Lagerfeld, okay. but we're not, not friends. But Tom Ford was very instrumental in, in helping you set up your own firm mm. with, with, with the, what was then PPR? Uh, it was Gucci, the Gucci, Gucci group, group. yeah. Sorry. It was Tom and Domenico. So what happened was I was at Chloe, and it was all going really well, and then I, I, got a, I was friends with Tom Ford, and he said, look, would you consider coming and doing Gucci? And I was like, yes, I would. And he said, well, we'd love you to come. I'd love you to come because I'm doing Saleron and I'm gonna, I will give up fur for you. And I said, that's amazing, but you know, Tom, I don't do leather either. And his fa I, honestly, his face was like, just he, he, he kind of froze for a moment. I said, he was like, oh, well, might have to reconsider that considering the house is basically based on, on right, leather. Right. So I, and so and I was fur. distraught. I was, well, fur they were willing to give okay. up. And back then that was a big deal. I know there's obviously a trend now, which is great that people are starting to, to relook at that. 
And um, so I was kind of, I was devastated that I had this moment, you know, I had this in my sights and then it was taken away from me. And then Tom called me up a week later and he said, look, would you consider doing your own brand with, with me and Domenico at, at the Gucci Group? Did your success <clears throat> there um, influence uh, Tom when he wanted to leave Gucci and start his own brand? Is it, is it because of me that Tom Ford well, has his own brand? Not because of you, but did, did that... <laughs> of course it is. <laughs> no, okay. Tom, no, 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 I had nothing to do with that. Okay. I okay. claim zero responsibility for Tom and his... Okay, there are a zillion young designers out there, and it's hard enough to make a name for yourself and cut through um, the sort of morass of the fashion world. Um, but you did it, uh, you added an extra layer of difficulty in doing it in a in a very environmental way. And was that very, very difficult at the beginning? Yeah, you know, it, um, it's funny, at the beginning, it, it's been an incredible kind of um, journey, really, in the, the beginning I came in, even once I, I was at Chloe, I said, look, I'm not gonna kill any animals for the name of fashion. And they, and anyone actually, the great thing about, I've been so fortunate in not compromising my kind of ethics for my work, is that people know what they're getting when they come to me. So people don't come to me unless they're willing to, to not work with leather or fur or PVC or, you know, or, and, and so at the time, I was like, look, you know, I'm not gonna kill animals. So that took out leather, it took out fur, it took out, really those were the two main ones actually. Um, but then it's really changed, the landscape has, has changed mm -hmm. because since then, there's been so much more discovery in the connection between animal welfare and, and you know, how much land mass we, we use or how much grain or how much water inefficiently is going into animals to go into a bag or a shoe. So the connection to the environment has, um, has become a different part of the conversation now, which so, I can't even remember your question actually. No, what was and, I and saying? Also, no, but also I remember one time you said that the fur <laughs> industry tries to influence young designers the way, say, the pharmaceutical <laughs> business tries to influence young medical students. Yeah, I'm, I remember being at St. Martin's and I was doing my final degree show and there was a girl working next to me and she had a little sheepskin and I was like, oh my God, like what is, and it, it, you know the thing is, it's not, in my humble opinion, fashionable. Like even if you don't mind the killing of the animals, I don't think it's relevant anymore and, and I don't think it, it's part of a conversation about the future of kind of fashion. So even then, 20 odd years ago, I was like, wow, sheepskin, like that didn't feel relevant even then to me. And she said, oh yeah, I've been sponsored by the sheepskin, but you know, I've been sponsored. And so, you know, they get in early, you know, it's, it's they're, they're a strong um, platform. And, and it's an interesting conversation because, you know, we're here, I feel like, have any of you seen Wild Wild Country? I feel like I'm in part of Wild Wild Country. Like I think we're all in the same, you know, we all believe in the same things here, which is, is wonderful. But I think that, um, you know, to get help, if, if I'd had the same encouragement and the same help, and even now, I'm doing it alone to a certain extent. You know, so many things that I've done, viscose, for example, I, I always ask this at things, and very few people know, does that, they may know a little more about, does anyone know what viscose, rayon, is made out of? Do you know? Well, viscose is a... Is a uh, Do you know what it is? Did Graydon get it right? No, no, I mean viscose? Yeah. Well, viscose is, a, is, a, is a, the, the thickness of a liquid. From? Uh, uh, from? From a liquidy thing. From a, you know. <laughs> you don't know? It's basically viscose is from trees, so it's a tree pulp. So, and, and the fashion industry cuts down around 150 million trees a year for viscose. It's a huge, you know, a huge consumption. It was actually 100 million last year, and it's 150 million this year. So I um, committed to trying to use viscose from a sustainable source, and... Um, I committed to that and I put a deadline to it and I actually achieved the deadline, which I think is rare also. And we also came in a little bit early. And um, we are now probably the only fashion house in the world using sustainable viscose. Mm. So, but it, when I would love help, you know what I'm like, I'd love everyone to do that because we don't, we, we've arrived at a place where the conventional way of doing things is very destructive. And if we started, if we all grouped together, we could all be doing viscose from a sustainable source. How do you make shoes out of something other than leather? leather? 
So the those f- look like leather. They do, and this is why Tom Ford nearly gave me the gig at Gucci, because he didn't even notice they weren't leather. <laughs> um, no, so I use, um, I use like a woven material, and then I do, do a variety of coatings. So some are vegetable oil coatings, some are... We don't use any PVC, so there's, there's, they're all good ingredients. Um, one of the big things that we have avoided from day one, which is hard, is glue. So glue is made out of either animal bones and God knows what other body parts or fish glue. So we, we don't use that. And um, we actually just spent about three years developing a sneaker that we've just launched called The Loop, which has not got any glue in it at all. And it's all biodegradable. And I'm very proud of that shoe. You have an associate. Uh-huh. You have an association with Adidas, and I think you said that uh, you both sort of mm-hmm. taught them a lot, and they taught you a lot. Can you sort of explain yeah. that a bit? No, they did teach me a lot. Um, I think what's interesting: some of these bigger, more mainstream brands are more accountable a lot of the time, and I think that they have a different consumer base. That, and I think that that is really exciting. And that's one really great thing about having a wide audience and a, a wider conversation is that the consumer will challenge you more. And so through my relationship with Adidas, I learned about PVC. I didn't know that PVC was, was a cancerous chemical for the people that work with it. I didn't know anything about it. But so I don't, I've not used that for a good sort of 10 All those little plastic years. figures your children play with, you know, with Disney characters. All made from I think PVC. everything is kind of PVC, and actually, it's and once you open up that can of worms, you know what happens with me is I'm a, really at the end of the day I'm just a fashion designer. Like this wasn't part of my plan to sit and have these conversations, and so it's interesting once you literally open up that can of worms. You're like, okay, so hey, I really feel for sequins this season, and I want like, and they're like, you can't, there's three sequins you can use that aren't PVC. And it's such a buzzkill because you're like, rah, rah, rah. okay, so that's going to look great in like that sequin. And that is the reality. You know, I can't make clear things anymore. I can't, you know. Well, it's funny. Stan Smith, who was a great American tennis player, I wanted to look up uh, on, on, on Google to see what a vegan Stan Smith running shoe looked like. Poor Stan Smith. I went through like two pages of Google before I became, got to Stan Smith, the man. His yeah. shoe is more famous than he is now. Yeah. And, I uh, met Stan Smith. Yeah, I've met Stan Smith. What's a vegan Stan <laughs> Smith? Stan Smith. <laughs> it's made out of this stuff. Oh, so what happened is um, Stan Smith is this very, you know, well-known sneaker, tennis sneaker that Adidas and have made, and it's, it's been hugely um, successful for them over many, many, many mm-hmm. years. And I was fortunate enough to get a vegetarian. My husband, with, through Adidas, got me a vegetarian pair of Stan Smiths made. And I was like the only person on the planet that had these Stan Smiths. And I said to the head of Adidas one day, I was like, look, you know, do you even know that my Stan Smiths are, are vegan? And he didn't know. And, um, and I said, why are your Stan Smiths not vegan? Because nobody knows that it's last, they're lasting as long, if not longer, than all the other Stan Smiths that my friends had. And um, anyway, I tried a whole kind of tactic. It didn't really work. But what I've just done is a Stella Stan Smith. So we now have a completely vegan Stella Stan Smith okay. that we've just launched. And uh, Another round of applause. I'm just going to tell you everything that I do. <laughs> it's tragic. It's really tragic. He's like this. So H&M. <laughs> so you ha- is H&M like walking into the lion's den if you're in this sort of business? Because they're sort of at the forefront of kind of turning things over in a, in a hurry. You know, it really depends on how you look at it. You know, obviously, you know, I did a collaboration with them many, many, many years ago, this one-off thing, and I came into the room. For me, it was, it was an interesting project because I wanted to have a wider conversation. And, I, you know, I don't always agree with higher price point things. Like, I struggle with that, you know, but at the same time, I really don't believe in landfill, and every single second, fast fashion is going into landfill or it's getting burnt. And, you know... 2% of plastic is recycled on this planet, which is appalling, and 1% of fashion is recycled. So, you know, it's not a great place that we're at. Um, but when I went into that collaboration, I said to them, I want to make X amount of it sustainable, and I want to use organic materials, and, and they were really open to that, you know, and um, they have been and become probably one of the more successful at being sustainable in the, in the high street. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, I'm a firm believer that you have to, you know, an investment in the environment is an investment in your life 
and an investment in what you consume is important. And so, you know, rather than getting 50 T-shirts, maybe get one good one that is going to last both in design and in, and in material and in make. You know, it's hard. We, we honestly, it takes up more time in my company, these conversations now, than, you know, creating product a lot of the time because we talk a lot about price points and trying to achieve a good price point, but also just being decent human beings and, and having decent labor practice, mm -hmm. you know, and it, it's a struggle because there's very few people doing that. Where now. are your clothes made? In a variety of places, mostly in Italy, in Europe. Mostly in Europe? You know, yeah. And how does you, when the customer comes into your shop, do they they're, they're sort of already up on on your opinions of sustainability and the environmental I don't know. impact? I don't really know. You know, I always really like it when they're not. I'm a, I love it if somebody comes in and they buy a pair of shoes and they have no idea they're not leather. Right. That for me is like I feel like I've really succeeded in my goal. Um, because like I say, you know, my job is to be a fashion designer and if I can create beautifully designed, desirable, timeless pieces that are made incredibly well, then why should you notice? Why should you sacrifice anything for that? But I, do, I think some people do come to me for that. I think younger people do. Um, I, I was with somebody recently and a woman said to me, she was like, you know what I love about your brand is I can come into one of your stores and you've done all the work for me. That's nice. I thought that was nice. And I, it made me realize that, yeah, for, for a handful of people, I tick boxes that they, you know, but you, you, th this is a life choice, you know, people make these choices when they eat and when they exercise and when they go on holiday, like this is now, it's part of the conversation and you know, fashion has to, we have to have these conversations, we have to be accountable, we need to be encouraged, there's not a huge, I mean, I'm not, I don't get benefits for this, my margins are smaller, I get taxed 30% more for a non-leather good going into the United okay, States. Okay, hold on, I've read that somewhere. So t what, what Why? <laughs> wait, wait you bring, if you bring in those shoes, you get taxed 30% more than if they were leather? I think it must hop back to like sort of Native American yeah. cowboy days, like yeah. what is that law? Actually, Why? There were no taxes back then, but anyway. Yeah. No, but you know what I mean? Like, I that's, don't, that's like a medieval yeah. taxation that I'm getting penalized for. That's something for. you might be able to beat. Well, I think that's sort of the point now. The, the point is, is how do we get encouragement? Because there's all these, and in everything in life, if you want to be an alternative thinker, if you want to be a change agent, how can we feel encouraged? You know, I feel so encouraged at this summit and you know I'm so privileged to be here and I'm so happy you guys are here it's so heartwarming and encouraging but we're probably like-minded people and you know I want to you know I'd love it if the fur industry would say hey Stella let's give up fur and let's create a really sustainable fake fur together because for me that's a more viable business in the future and I need that I need help like we're not perfect at Stella McCartney we're trying really hard but we're not and, um, you know, it would be nice if America would drop that 30% tax. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think there's a bunch of young fashion designers up here. And um, so if, if, what would you suggest to a young fashion designer starting out how to adapt this and build this into your business when it's hard enough to raise money? You know, I think just start, have the thought in, in the conversation. Don't go into the room without this consideration. Because, you know, for me, it's as much about trying to be responsible and mindful in my workplace as much as trying to solve problems in the fashion industry. You know, I think that you have to go into business trying to look out for others and look, and that includes the creatures that we share the planet with, you know? And so I think, you, you know, just coming into the room with a, a kind of thought for that, I think is great starting point. And, um, you know, ask questions and, and demand more. And, and I need people to help create a demand. You know, I need, when I want organic cotton, I need now those looms that are for the conventional cotton with all the chemicals, and I need my looms to be all organic and I need as many people to use those looms. And so I think just, you know, you know, anything is better than nothing. I really believe that. And I don't think you need to beat yourself up. I think if you just say, hey, you know what, I'll make one pair of non-leather shoes 
and I'll look into not using a conventional glue and I'll try and see if I can afford to do that. Or, you know, just even trying, I think, is what I would encourage. The, um, uh, and caring is one of the, at least to my mind, one of the more environmentally conscious of the big sort of luxury empires. Um, why are you buying your company back from them? It's not really about that. They are. And, you know, I love them, and I've, I have not a bad word to say about them. But I think it's more about um, me, probably, than them. And I, I do believe, as a, a woman in the fashion industry with her name on the door that had the option to have 100%, it's so rare. I think it would have been rude not to. <laughs> Wish me luck, guys. <laughs> Are you, uh, do you consider yourself a designer first and then a businesswoman or a businesswoman and a, then a designer? A designer first, because that's what I, you know, that's what I've always wanted to do. That's what I trained to do. Um, but I really love the business side. I don't, I think unless you have, you know, unless you start out and you have like your kind of right hand person in business, you, you you think that way, and you know, I don't think, um, I like the business. I've always found it interesting that there is this kind of fight between creatives and business. There's always a tension, and, and I don't think it's healthy. I think that, you know, you have to have both. Are you the CEO of your business? No. Oh, there's to be I think I'm something, I think I'm, I, I don't know what I am. But if there's an argument between business and creativity, I think I'm more, a little more who, than a CEO. Who wins? It's sort of like t two minds of the same brain. I mean, do you get to overrule the business person, or the business person gets to overrule? The I, you know person? what? I don't want to ever get into a, a position where I'm, I'm massively overruling anyone. No. I think every single day I'm overruling most right. people. Right. No, we. You know what? At Stella McCartney, the, the great thing that's happened with us now that we're kind of, we've had a little bit of time. Um, behind us is people come to work with me because this is how they want to work. Mm -hmm. And so I think we attract as a business people that want to, you know, have a kind of a possibly a more conscious way of, of working. And so I don't have to overrule heavily to my knowledge. But you know what? There are a few people here that work with me. <laughs> they might disagree with <laughs> yeah. you. You know, it's funny. I, 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 my previous job for 25 years, I had to go to fashion shows. I don't know if you've ever been to any. I mean, they're, they're like the lowest form of misery you can imagine, <laughs> except yours. And yours were like brilliant, and they were done in little gardens in the East Village that I didn't even know existed, and I lived downtown. And you had a very cool Airstream trailer, I remember, where the side opened up, and they served cocktails, and you had like jugglers. And, and, you're, and you did Fire one, eaters. You did one in, in Edinburgh, you did one in London where the, the, it was a Scottish theme or something like that. Why did we you love break, a good why, party at Stella McCartney. Why did you break out of the, sort of the mold of, of the traditional fashion show? We still do traditional fashion shows, but we also try and make them fun. Like a couple of seasons ago, we had a dance at the end, and we'd like, you know, we... Ah, uh, you know, I, I just want to have fun essentially in in this you know job as well and i think you guys do too you know i understand i'm really aware that fashion seasons are relentless for the people that have to go and for me i'm like how can we just make this an enjoyable experience i don't think you know in the day and age we live in you don't need to have always this kind of sort of conventional runway show that gives you a picture you know you can actually try and enjoy yourself at the same time if you're walking down, first of all, are you musical at all? Uh, yeah. You can carry a tune? Yeah. Really? Okay. Let me, yeah, I can. Okay. <laughs> you can do something right now. Yeah, no, if you, you know, give me a cappella. Something. I mean, give um, me something. If you're walking down the street with your father, who gets noticed more? <laughs> That's ridiculous. I think or is it an age father. thing? No, my dad, of course. Christ. That would be like the most appalling thing. I don't ever want to get as okay. recognized as my dad. That okay. like. Look, my intention has always been actually to, I stick to what I know, you know, like I grew up with one of the most famous people in the world and it, I, obviously there are huge benefits to that, but at the same time I did, I did sort of see that for me personally, if you know or take an interest in fashion, then you might know who I am. That was kind of... 
And the logo, which I think is a very good logo. How did you come about that? With the, it sort of looks like, you know, cosmetic lights or... My no, logo, lights. well, you know, it's funny. The, the, I think I, I did my logo way before I thought I'd ever have a shop or ever have a bag or, you know, to put a, you know, a product in. And I, my logo is about the length of this. To, it's the longest logo on the planet. So it, it's a cumbersome little creature to execute. But... Um, I, it came about because I'm a Virgo and I like symmetry and I was like, oh, there's six letters here and six letters here and I can do something with the A's and, you know, I kind of, and then the dots were to feminize it. But I worked with my husband on that logo. That's how I met him. Where's the Stella? Oh, I didn't know that. Oh. Where does the Stella come from? <laughs> we can talk about that later, Graydon. Yeah, okay. Where does, <laughs> Where does Stella, Stella come from? from? My, um, on my Russian side, on my mum's side, um, American, goes back to both of my great grandmothers from Russia were called Stella. Okay. It's a fiery name, Stella, it's isn't it? Name. It's a good yeah, name. Yeah, yeah. yeah. street car name. Anyone else called Stella in here? No, the little crowd know. participation. No Stellas in here. I'm okay. deeply offended. I'm actually really happy as well, but I'm kind of deeply offended. Okay, we're running, we're running over. I wanted to thank you all. Oh, and thanks, Stella. That was is fabulous. this where the music thank comes you. in at yeah, the Oscars? Like, ah! Yeah. <laughs> thank you.